uh, Malaysia Research, Research Institute on Aging UPM. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Puan Norizal and TMC for inviting us, me and uh, Professor Dr. Kong Ismashri to come here today to MCMC. So she's here for one month and the, under the uh, who brought us a very long name? Okay. Uh, Fulbright MCMC US Specialist Program where we have our specialists from US come to consult us on this topic which is agent care. Okay, I think I will, uh, before she starts, I will give some, uh, let me uh, introduce her a bit. Okay. So, Professor Dr. Connie Ibashri, okay, is a healthcare executive who tracks and analyzes of management and academia, healthcare and health system, and public health. Uh, she has a master's, especially a master's degree from Stanford University, and later on, master's and doctoral degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think without further ado, shall we invite uh, So thank you all very much for inviting me. Um, I am. I think when we turn this off, I'm not sure this is the latest. So I have several versions. So maybe I need to go back to the beginning and make sure we've got the one that has a couple slides in just for you all. Um, so let me see if I can. Showing the technology doesn't always work. It doesn't look like that on my screen. It's more colorful. Mine's all black because we had to change it black yesterday. The screen was yellow. So we said, okay, how can we fix that? is that, it, that Malaysia is becoming one of the older countries and you've got a relatively short amount of time to prepare for that. So in the United States, we are now about 15% of our population is over the age of 65. We started, but it took us 120 years to get there. So in 1900, 4% of the US population was over 65 and we just hit 15%. In Malaysia, you're about 6.7% now, but between 2020, that's next year, and 2046, you're gonna to go to 15% of your population being over the age of 65. So we've had 120 years 
solve the problems of aging, and we haven't done it yet. You've got 25, 26 years to figure out how to help people age gracefully and productively, and a relatively short time span to do that. So we really like to say, well, you guys know how to use technology. Um, my aging knows about aging. <laughs> how can we get these two pieces together so that we can use the technology to really help people who here age with be healthy, happy, independent, and productive? Mm -hmm. um, Doctor, how is that comparative to other Asian uh, countries in terms of aging? Uh, well, let me, uh, now that the slides are working, I can't, I don't have the data for other Asian countries, um, but I think we can at least, okay, so the question is, you know, we're aging longer, are we aging better? Can technology help? Um, so let's say that the goal for successful aging is that we would be grateful if all people aged so that they were healthy, they were happy, they were independent, and they were productive. So we were just chatting briefly about keeping older people in the workforce or keeping them as active volunteers, and what does that take? So we're calling that HIP. And if you know jargon in English, HIP means cool, or neat, or or what? Okay. Um, so here's a picture of the world and the aging status. You can see from the ones of the map at the top, most of the countries are yellow and green. That means that less than their population age 65 and over is less than 20% of their population. And in fact, in 2015, it was about 13 countries uh, that had a population of 65 and over that was 20% or more of their population. But you can see by the time we get to 2050, the map has turned mostly red, orange, and cherry. So the whole world is aging. Uh, and we now, by 2050, have 87 countries uh, that where more than 20% of the population is over the age of 65. So the only countries that aren't aging really rapidly um, are the ones in Africa, and that's because of the AIDS epidemic, and if we ever figure out how to solve AIDS, then Africa will catch up with everybody else in terms of aging. So you can see some of the other aging countries, uh, Asian countries on the map there. India stays relatively young, uh, but the rest of Asia, uh, pretty much turns uh, darker colors, so all of Asia uh, is pretty much aging. Um, this just shows you that in Malaysia, this is the statistics from Monday's paper, so aging was in the star, it was on page three on Monday as a national issue, so we know this is a timely topic. 32.6 uh, million people over the age of, uh, in the country, and over two million that were um, over the age of 65, and we're now using 65 rather than 60. So throughout my comments, most of the slides are on using 65. Um, so 6.7 percent of the population in Malaysia now is over 65. But again, you're going to 15. In the USA, it's about not quite, almost 15 percent of our population. Japan is the oldest country in the world. Uh, they are already at almost 28% of their population over the age of 65. Um, and so in terms of other Asian countries, uh, Japan leaves the world. Um, but Finland, uh, Europe is, is, most of the countries are old. Right now, Germany and Italy are the two oldest countries in Europe. But Finland is on track. Finland's a, a large geographic country, small population, 5.5 million people. Uh, but they are expecting, in, by 2030, to have 1.2 million people, uh, already 22% uh, of their population, over the age of 65. And they have not begun to prepare at all. So you're not alone in facing the aging issues, uh, but it's really timely to do something soon. So I want to talk a little bit and share some statistics with you that mostly come from my aging, uh, that come from your Ministry of Statistics, of how Malaysia is aging and how that affects the nation. Okay. So first of all, this is, uh, this is the one that's actually technologically that moves. Yeah, there you can see how the population changes from a triangle with lots of young people uh, to really becomes more and more like an oblong uh, with more and more older people and more very old people. So as this reaches its end, you can see the numbers at the top get up into the 90s 
So how are we going to care for all these people um, who are very old? And you, the numbers down at the bottom of it's 20, 40 goes up to 20, 50, I think, and then it stops. Yeah, okay. So the population is definitely aging. This just also shows uh, how it's aging and that that relatively short time span uh, between 2020 and 2046, when the population goes from about 7%, age 65 and over to 14%. Um, so, uh, no denying it. Um, what happens when the population goes up? A whole lot of other things in the country change. So the healthcare expenditures, this just shows that they're already rising and you don't even have that aging bulge yet. But as you get more older people, you will have more health expenditures because the people who use health services the most are mothers and with newborn babies and older people. So that rise in the number of older people is gonna also cause a rise in your health expenditures. And since a lot of those are paid for uh, either by the government or out of pack pocket, you're all paying for them one way or another, either through your taxes or through uh, your own personal bank accounts. So this uh, healthcare expenditures and all the healthcare resources that are needed by older people will also go up. Uh, the labor force changes as the population ages and the more older people retire. Uh, so you've already changed your um, workforce retirement age from 55 to 60. We in the United States change from 65 to 67. We need to change ours to 70 or above. So uh, that's something to be considered in Malaysia is why should you make people retire at 60 if they're still, if they want to work, if they're still productive, if they're still healthy? Um, because once they retire, then who's supporting them? And is that, uh, again, you through your taxes or family members, why not let people continue to work and be productive unless they want to pay or there's a reason? Okay. The other thing that happens when the, the older people uh, are more of your population and they retire is that something called the dependency ratio changes. So the dependency ratio, I think you can, I can just not trip over this. If you look where you are right now, this is, these are the number of older people and we'll assume most of them are retired. So you've got uh, about two people for every 10 people who are in the workforce. This green line is people between 20 and 60, 20 and 59 who are working. So there are 10 people out there who are earning a living, paying taxes, taking care of people for every two people who are retired. As you get, as Malaysia ages, this number, this span decreases, and by the time you get to the end of the century, there are fewer than two people working for every person who's retired. That's really not economically sustainable uh, if, you're, if these older people who, if they are retired and are not being productive, uh, you've got a very skewed income tax uh, issue. So if you can get those people to be 65 and older and still working, uh, then this is not so bad. Uh, gender differences uh, are, are real, so we have differences at life expectancy at birth, but what many people don't realize is, is if you live to be 60, uh, if you get that old, then you're gonna get to be even older. So there's uh, men typically tend to live another 18 years, so till they're 78. Women live another 21 years, so uh, those of us who are ladies, you know, we have all those years to look forward to. How are you going to spend them? And uh, can you be happy, healthy, independent, and productive in all those years? In Malaysia, ethnicity is a real issue. I don't really need to tell you that. I've learned that since I've been here. Um, but because we're looking at how can we help older people still be happy and productive, uh, it needs to be done here with a sensitivity toward ethnicity, culture, religion. Um, so you can tell from this chart that the Chinese people typically live longer on average uh, than, than the Chinese live longer than average. Uh, Indians live shorter than average and Malays are kind of uh, close to average. So as you're thinking about Again, how are we uh, going to work with our older population? Uh, we have to realize that the Chinese are gonna be very old, so maybe you do some activities 
or initiatives with, with their community that's even different uh, than, than others. So that ethnic sensitivity is important too. Yeah. Caregiving and workforce stresses are very real impacts of aging on the total country. Okay? So one of the issues is, do you have enough people uh, in your workforce to take care of all the older people who are uh, more prevalent, who need help, who as they grow older um, uh, need assistance from other people and maybe their family members are not available. In the U.S., of the top 10 jobs for the next generation, three of them are to do with caring for the older population. So we have a, a demand for nursing assistance, for home care assistance, and for uh, other uh, nursing type people. So those are the three, three of our biggest jobs. The other jobs are mostly in high tech, and that's no surprise. Uh, but the, so many jobs in aging is somewhat of a surprise. So how do we recruit people into the field? Uh, how do we train them? And from your perspective, how do you teach them to use technology so we can get the maximum out of all the people who are working and want to be in the field of aging? Because that's not everybody's uh, preference. The second, in oh, and, uh, yeah, you can't really see that, but the loss of productivity um, for people who are out in the workforce. In the US, it's $131 billion a year. Um, or about 550 billion ringgits. Um, so we looked at the lost productivity uh, of our workforce um, because people have to take time out to care for their family members or they retire. So if you can see this lady, she has 10 adults or almost adults uh, with her. Many of them have no doubt taken time off work to take her to the doctor to come and see if she's okay. Maybe one of them's even retired because she's clearly living at home, her home, or maybe her, uh, one of her children's home. Um, so we calculate how much we have lost productivity um, that is in two ways. One is lost wages. So for every uh, hour that these folks have to take off work, they are not earning their own income and they're not paying taxes into the government. Okay, so that's a, a loss. We calculate that the loss for uh, something as simple as arthritis. Now, arthritis doesn't even put you in bed or make you disabled, but the lost wages from, uh, from arthritis in the U.S. in any given year, $164 billion, okay, or uh, almost 690 billion ringgits lost from people taking time off work because of arthritis problems. That's a ton of money. And if we add up all the chronic conditions, it's even more money. Okay. From the employer's standpoint, they're also losing money okay, because they have employees who have to take time off to go take care of their family members, so they're losing, um, they're losing productivity. They have workers who quit before they had expected to, and then they have to recruit somebody new, and then they have to go through all the costs of, of hiring. So the cost of employment of caregiving uh, is huge. And we've been, in the US, we've been working at this for 30 years. We have some adaptations of how do we make our workplaces caregiver friendly? How do we make our employees want to continue working? What kind of adaptations do we have so they can not have to retire and stay home and take care of their older person? So, what can we do and how can technology help? And there are a lot of ways that technology can help um, with the employment situation. Um, another issue that, um, where, again, where technology might help, we don't have good data on the cost. But just to give you a couple of examples of how you can uh, plan ahead. So we, there are a lot of infrastructure issues that need to be made when the population is aging and when you've recognized that. So at some point, uh, about 1990, the U.S. said, we need to make our communities user-friendly. We need to have places where wheelchairs and walkers can go easily. And so we decided to do curb cuts, and that was national legislation. So our country is about um, 5,000 uh, kilometers from east to west. It's about 3,200 kilometers from north to south. We went back and cut curb cuts 
in every single sidewalk throughout the whole country. If you can imagine, I don't know what that costs. I don't think anybody wants to calculate that number. Um, but it costs about at least 500, maybe $1,500 for every curb cut. So, you know, that's maybe 6,000 ringgits for your whole country for every curb. When I look at all these cranes around and all this construction, just do your curb cuts in advance. So don't have to go back and do them later. Okay? Same thing with buses. Um, you can get buses that are wheelchair friendly and they're good not only for wheelchairs and walkers but for mothers with babies. Okay? You can add these afterwards and that's kind of what they've done here. But you can also order your buses, which they've done in Finland, despite not having huge numbers of elderly. This is, is uh, the, the back door. Not only does it roll out so people with wheelchairs can roll right in, and baby carriages, uh, they have a whole section of the bus that's available uh, just for people who have um, some kind of, of device with them. And it's really easy, and they roll in, they don't have to pay, they roll out. The bus doesn't stop any longer because it's all set up. But they, I'm sure those buses are more expensive, but it's cheaper to get it in, at the beginning uh, than it is to add it afterwards. So uh, wheelchair lift, then there's the cost uh, in ringgits if you add it after the fact. So lots of these infrastructure issues haven't really been thought about in advance. You have the opportunity to say, you know, how do we need to adapt all of the infrastructure? Uh, every ministry, every agency, what's the implication for aging and can you do it in advance? And from your perspective, can technology help you? And what kind of technology would that be? Okay, um, how does aging affect an individual? Uh, some of you may already know this from your aging um, relatives, but let me just hit a couple of highlights. Sensory limitations. Uh, older people, about 30% about of people over the age of 60, uh, over the age of 60, have hearing loss. By the time you get to be 75, 75% 75 of people have hearing loss. Okay. Our health insurance in the United States does not pay for hearing aids. Uh, you wonder what's wrong with them because that's a major problem of seniors. From a visual standpoint, uh, about 50% of all people over 65 uh, have some kind of, of low vision. Some of that can be fixed with technology, some of it can't. Uh, but that means that we have older people who can't really hear, they can't really see uh, well, and they're trying to do all the activities that they did when they were 20 and 30 and, and 40. Cognitive decline um, is the one major problem worldwide that we just don't know how to diagnose, prevent, or cure. So 10 leading causes of death in the United States for nine of them, we can pre predict them and or prevent them or cure them. One, we can't, and that's cognitive decline. So as we have more and more older people worldwide, the increase in dementia and in Alzheimer's disease specifically, and other forms of dementia, is increasing from 44 million people who have severe dementia right now um, around the world to 115 million people around the world with severe dementia and those people need help. They need caregivers, they need family members, they need any kind of technology you can think of uh, until we can get a handle on uh, how to, to do a better job of diagnosing, preventing, and, and fixing uh, dementia. Okay. So major worldwide problem will be a problem here as well. Chronic conditions, um, almost every half of Everyone over the age of 65 has at least one chronic condition. Um, by the time you get to be 75, most people have a chronic condition or more than one chronic condition. Uh, and those result in uh, medications. And so then we have people taking lots of medications. And that's a problem. And that's something that technology can really help with. Uh, people lose their ability to function. So uh, ADLs are activities of daily living, is the acronym for large motor movements, uh, transportation. So walking, lifting, transferring, bathing, 
those basic activities we do every day, um, but if you lose the ability to do them, then you have, you're, you're in trouble. You need help. Okay. IADLs are the instrumental activities of daily living, and those are the things that require fine motor skills or cognition. So paying your bills, um, signing up on the internet for a new credit card, uh, ordering your groceries, going to the grocery store, ordering transportation, punching in the buttons for grab, all those are instrumental activities of daily living, and older people also have a decline in those. So as we age, almost no matter what kind of chronic conditions you have, you lose the ability to function, and then you need help from a human or a robot or some other kind of technology. Okay. All these things, when you have all these, you, add, you end up with emotional distress. So we uh, may have the illusion of Hollywood of, you know, you grow happily ever after, but once you get old, it's not necessarily happy ever after. Uh, it, it may be quite the opposite. So we have to figure out, you know, how do we combat the emotional challenges of aging for an individual, but also for family. Families get stressed out. Suddenly they have to take care of their young kids and their older family members. Older family members are depressed. It, you know, it's a big constellation of potentially social issues that affect family relationships and then siblings start fighting and wow, all kinds of things happen. So can you prevent that? If we, can we think in advance? How can we help families and individuals so that they avoid the emotional challenges of aging? So, all those things happen when you're, uh, when you're older. I wanted to just mention briefly, because you all deal with communications, what are the implications of aging for communications? Okay. So just to hit a few highlights, one is with print media, uh, and whether that's actual newspapers or whether you're reading something on a computer or trying to read something on a smartphone, if you have low vision, it's hard to see any of those things. So print has to be clear, it has to be a big font, uh, black color is, uh, is actually the best, um, and we have some things on using computers where when people like press the button for low access, um, it doesn't work. Okay. Or it, it makes the font bigger but it skews the page and half the page is cut off. So there are a lot of things we can do with our technology to accommodate loss of vision, but we don't always do it, and certainly that's not the norm of when you know the 22-year-old is making a new app. He's not really thinking about uh, the 82-year-old who might benefit from using it. And what does it look like? Um, so print media is something, visual media, whatever kind it is, again, contrast and colors makes a huge difference. Um, as we age, our eyes yellow. So yesterday when we tried the presentation and the cable was wrong and all the slides looked yellow, I said, well, that's just a good example of what it looks like when you're old. Everything's yellow. And all the blues turn to green and the greens turn to yellow. And it was, it was not good. And like, how do you know uh, what the color of the traffic light is? So uh, colors are important. Um, in terms of audio media, so it says, you know, play this thing on, on YouTube or listen to the instructions. If you can't hear, and that's 75% of people over 75, you can't understand what the directions are. You don't know what the video is telling you. So we have to think, how do we accommodate that? And is it turning up the volume or is it uh, constructing uh, the original um, media in a different way? Um, there are lots of things that have to do with computers and gadgets and electronics, including the buttons. Uh, if you're old and you have quad hands and you have arthritic fingers, it's just really hard to push those buttons, especially when they're itty bitty. Okay? So at least you guys in Asia have larger smartphones. All of our smartphones are still small, okay? and that's the preferred. We're getting to the bigger one, but why is really tiny? So, anything that takes a button to push might be difficult for an older person to touch and get the right button, to see if they can't really read the numbers. Um, so, touch screens might not work. Uh, scrolling, 
pushing the URL if it's small to get to the next page of a website, all those things that we just take for granted are much harder when you're old and you can't see and your fingers don't work and you can't hear and it's just a struggle. Um, so comprehension is another issue and that is, um, you know, we, we don't know exactly when dementia starts. It doesn't start, some people are still okay in their 90s, um, but messages need to be clear, they need to be simple. So as you're doing a lot of your uh, messaging, whether it's regulatory or, or some other variation, um, you can maybe think of who's, who's your audience, and as we have more older people, especially if we keep them in the workforce, uh, how can you make the messages clear and simple so they can be understood? Okay, uh, just sort of a side note, we know how to, to age so that we stay healthy, happy, independent, and productive, other than preventing dementia. We know how to do this, and we don't do it. Why not? And one of our questions is, um, can technology help us? Can technology lead to better aging because it helps us uh, be preventive, be active, accommodate for uh, various kinds of declines, uh, and keep us interested in life, okay, and keep us socially uh, engaged. So technology may be able to help with some of the things in aging that we should do and we just don't, okay. Um, now, what's the role for you? So I have a whole rest of the presentation. I can show you how we're using technology in the United States, um, but I know some of you may have other things to do, so I wanted to just throw out a few things um, that I thought might be relevant to you based on the little that I know about you and what I have found on your website as I was scrolling through. Um, so I love your report on the Internet of Things and all the activities that are going on in all these different spheres in Malaysia, some of which are ongoing and some of which are pilot projects. Um, but as I was reading through that, I thought, well, where's the, where's the accommodation or recognition of aging? So all these pilot projects um, or new initiatives or things that are being tried in one place or another, um, do they pertain to aging? Have you thought about aging? So the whole smart house thing is perfect for aging, but have you thought about how it's implemented? Uh, getting out to rural areas is really important for older people who are isolated in rural areas or even alone during the day. Have you thought about how your, how your uh, technology accommodations are affecting the aged people in rural areas? As you're looking at regulating the whole radio industry, has anybody thought about, mm, well, are some of these messages going out to uh, older people who have trouble hearing? So, so I thought, well, okay, there are a lot of things that you might do if you just put on that perspective of what does this mean for an aging society where we want to keep people productive and independent? Uh, what does it mean for the individual? And how can we kind of build in that aging aspect to everything that you're doing? You also might distinguish between the regulatory role and the education role. So I, I understand that part of your task is to regulate and to license and uh, dealing with the people who are making technology. And there you can do some things to ask them. Have they thought about aging? Have they made their websites so that people who press the access button because they want large font, you know, does it still fit on the page? So are, are they, in your regulatory capacity, are you building in aging accommodations? And, and then, what's the education opportunity? So, as all these companies roll out their new technologies, as you roll out new technologies, are you educating families and seniors and employers how to use these technologies to facilitate aging? So, I think you could, you could um, do a lot by just helping people understand how this technology, how this smart house, which is great for the young 20-somethings who love technology, but how could it also be used for the older person? Uh, and is the technology fine as it is, or do you need a, a minor adaptation or a different grade, whatever? Um, encouraging messages to be sensitive to the, career, to the characteristics <coughs> of older adults. Again, I know you do some regulation, and here again I was thinking, 
uh, of the radio announcements and are you helping your radios understand how to broadcast to an older population? What messages, what volumes, uh, what kind of um, um, education uh, can they be sending out to seniors? Um, educate older adults and families in what to look for in purchasing technology. I don't know if you really get into that, um, but I think some of the work that you do has to do with what vendors offer, um, but you might turn it around and say, can we help uh, families understand how to buy better at the beginning? So let's get these things right the first time. So uh, if, if the family is, wants to do a smart house and they want to buy a security system, uh, what do they need to look for so they can protect not only their, uh, their babies and, and prevent them from SIDS, but what do they need to look for for older people? And let's buy a system that is ready for older people, not just um, you know, younger people. The okay, same thing with your vendors. Um, educate your providers about what to look for in purchasing technology. So as you're trying to digitize and get the whole country interoperable, uh, we have just so many horror stories in the United States about healthcare providers that said, we're gonna be forefront, we're gonna buy new technology that's gonna help our providers and help our patients. And it's a terrible system. It doesn't work. It's not interoperable. The vendor who sold it to them goes out of business. Um, so we spend $60 billion a year on an office to coordinate healthcare technology. And the, the office doesn't do technology. They just coordinate and try to help our rollout of electronic health records. Um, I think for every dollar that they spend at the national level, we probably have four dollars that are wasted by health systems that invest in something that is wrong. It's not interoperable. We can't get our inpatient records to match with our outpatient records. So you could do a real service by telling your the folks who are buying on the provider side what they need to do and do it up front. One of my doctors in Washington spent $100,000, so 4.2 ringgits in um, getting a new electronic health record and, and converting and all the staff and putting everybody's record into an electronic system. Less than a year later, the people who sold it to him went out of business. So he had to just start all over again. And it wasn't just the money. It was all the staff time. It was all the disruption to his practice, it was all the anger to the patients, most of whom were older, um, because they had to give the information over again. Where do I live? You no, know, have I had my vaccination? Da, da, da. So this cost of picking the wrong technology as a provider company is severe, and if you're dealing with a lot of older patients who have a lot of complicated problems, they have a lot in their health record. They have a lot in their social service record. And as you're looking at friendly communities and high-tech digitized communities, connecting the doctors and the uh, social service people and the hospitals, uh, that's a, a major contribution to getting uh, an aging society really well organized. Nobody's done it well. You could be the first. But you need to be thinking about it, and you're the agency who could really drive that. Um, so yeah, community initiatives to promote age-friendly orientation. Um, one of the things that we're doing in the United States, so I know that's one of your priorities here too, is uh, smart houses, that's, we can talk more about smart houses for aging, and friendly communities. So we have um, various initiatives. One of them is Walk America. We're trying to encourage everybody to walk, which is good for everybody, more exercise but particularly for seniors, okay, who otherwise might stay in and be isolated. So we have, we have used large data and various kinds of technology to get GPS systems and cameras to go throughout the United States and look at a, assess a community from the standpoint of how much green space is there, 
how many parks are there, how many sidewalks are there or good places for walking, how many curb cuts are there. So they take all that data that's um, G GPS specific with a camera and they put it into a large data set and they m make an index of how walkable is this community. And they have created an index by looking at all these places and then going out and flying them and saying, okay, if it's 10, it's a really walkable, good community and it's probably good for everybody. Particularly good for the aged and, and for small family, families with young children. And then we take that walkability index and we give it to the real estate people and they put it on their multiple listing service so if I want to buy a house 3,000 miles away for a summer home in Maine, which is the other end of the country from where I live, I can see what's the walkability index of all these houses that are listed on the real estate website. Okay. So it's, a, it's an example of using GPS technology and research technology, uh, visual technology, creating the database, creating the index, giving it to the realtors and being able to compare in any given community, I want a house that has the most green space, that's next to the most parks. How do I get that? We can do that. You can do that. You can probably do it even better than we can, but it's the kind of using technology to help a community really be age friendly uh, and letting everybody know it okay? and saying, hey, if you want to high index and a high people to buy in your neighborhood, you better have a high walkability score. So better build the park, better cut those curbs. Okay. So all this, having some of this information out there and available goes back upstream to say, how do we create the healthy communities and who's responsible? How do we have governments and individuals to do that? Um, uh, and I guess my, my final point is to focus on the long-term issues of how do you get the infrastructure that connects the various service providers uh, in a community for seniors, connects the people who are responsible for safety, uh, the police with the, uh, uh, with the health system, and the fire and all of those, so all, all of your services uh, connected, do they communicate? Um, and as a result, maybe we can have healthy aging. So getting that long-term perspective from the infrastructure level is something that MCMC is positioned to do uh, if you sort of accepted aging as uh, part of your, if you wanted to champion that as a cause. Okay. So, um, anyway, I think that's, that's about, that's about 45 minutes. We can stop here. I've got a lot more slides I can show you. I can tell you more about what's happening in the U.S., but I think more is happening here. Uh, it's just, are you applying it or could you apply it to aging? Um, so maybe we can stop at this point and see if you have any questions that I might be able to answer or CD could answer in terms of what is my aging doing uh, and their efforts to develop prototypes uh, of high-tech uh, housing uh, that would help age, help people age well. So, any questions? Um, I like I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I like how you quoted some metrics on um, the possible consequences of aging. Um, are these things that you have been teaching uh, Dr. Siti in terms of in Malaysia? How do we uh, quantify, for example? Um, the technological impacts of um, the impact of technology on the aging society in Malaysia. Those are the things that would be really helpful for the MCMC. So we, so CJ and I have been doing a, a lot of you know, educating each other. We haven't really focused on the quantitative aspects of technology. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on what else is happening because you've got staff who are working on that. I use mostly U.S. numbers because those are the ones that I'm familiar with. But we, yeah, we need to develop the same sort of evidence base for things that we need to do. And without those metrics, sometimes it's difficult to push forward a particular agenda uh, in terms of what to be addressing. Things like that. So the folks at the University of Washington in Seattle 
to Washington and in, in, in uh, the U.S. have this incredible data system where they pooled all these big data uh, from all kinds of different measures, and it's all graphed and it's high fancy, uh, you know, graphic displays of almost any question that you want, uh, particularly in the health and social services. So I'm sure that there are, I'm sure there are technology gurus out there who could really help you figure out, okay, what, what can you measure? I think the most important question is, what's the priority? So given that you've got a new government, given that you've got all these kinds of technology, which ones are most important to focus on first? Uh, is it helping individual seniors with new hearing aids, which I think is super important because my mother was profoundly deaf and we tried all kinds of hearing aids? Or is it helping aging communities? Or is it getting your high-tech businesses to be uh, user-friendly? So I think if you know what your priorities are, then you can back into or identify how do we want to measure the impact on society of that and then find the people who've got the data and the techniques yeah. that could be applied so here. So perhaps um, you're continuing work with your DCP might be developing this sort of metric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you can help MCMC, that would be wonderful. Good, so now CD has a charge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, thank you. Um, other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it would be interesting if you could just share, since you, have, you see you have so many slides, some of you as examples of these applications of technology to reading the population. Okay, so let me just if you can ask you quickly, how many of you have aging family members and have used technology to help them? way too young. I I will do this. I will do this quickly, and then we'll break for tea. But so I'll, I'll pick the slides that. Um, okay, so we we define technology here as something that has software, hardware, and an electrical supply. So there's all kinds of technology um, we're defining. That's how we're defining this. Um, and there are lots of interventions, and I can go into a lot more details, but. Um, we use this ecological model of health that says how do you intervene for an older person at the individual level, at the family relationship level, at the community level, at the societal level. You, you can use technology in all these different ways and you have many of it uh, under, your, um, under your authority. So let me just tell you some of the individual intervention levels. Uh, and the case I use is my mother. So this is my mother. I'll tell you the story of Helen. She was 97 when this picture was taken, okay. and she was profoundly deaf. Uh, she lived in her house because she refused to move out of her house. So many seniors want to live in their own house, um, and she, you know, the good and the bad of it. Okay, so she lived in the house. My sister lived with her. My sister's two teenage children lived with her, but we still had caregivers round the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are all kinds of people coming and going in this house. Okay. However, she was profoundly deaf. So the first thing we did was to get her a hearing aid. Um, hearing aids come in all shapes and sizes, and despite the fact that some of them work, uh, and she could hear better, um, it was a constant struggle. It's like, is it the left one or the right one? Which ear does this go in? You only have two choices, and half the time she and the caregivers got it wrong. Okay. Um, and then the batteries were always dying, or it didn't really work, and it was a nuisance. So high tech, but uh, not not didn't solve the problem totally. We got her a telephone. So the telephone uh, was they offer these big red phones for free from the government. And not only does it have big buttons, so she could push it easily, but it lights up if there's a telephone call. So since she can't hear, it lights up. But then it also has a bar across the top that scrolls text. So she didn't ever have to hear. It converts the, the message to text. People who call her know that. So my brother would call and he would say, Hi mom, this is your son, reminder there, George. Okay. She would read it and she would say without ever hearing, Hi George, thanks for calling, how are you? And George would say, 
fine, Mom, how are you? And she would say, fine, dear, thanks for calling, bye. And he would say, goodbye, Mom. <laughs> so they would have, this conversation went on because she was getting a little demented. They had that twice a week for about three or four years, okay? But she knew he would call and she would talk to him and she never heard a thing. Now, the phone actually would increase volume and you could hear with it, but by the time she got it, she was so deaf that it, it was easier for her to read the text, okay? So, got that. Uh, we got her a smartphone, not so she could use it as a phone, but so she could see the pictures and the text. So she liked the pictures of the family. I would send her a picture three or four times a week, and we would send text to her, but we also sent text to the phone, to the caregivers. Hey, remind mom it's Linda's birthday. Tell mom, tell Linda happy birthday, okay? So we tried to keep the social interaction by sending my mother text messages and the caregiver text messages. And she loved, she loved the cell phone, okay? And there's, some people think older people can't use technology. Uh, we have one study in the United States that 45% of people over the age of 85 have their computers in their house and log in at least once a week, if not once a day. So, you know, they may not be using a smartphone, but they've got their computer and they use it. Okay. Then uh, we got her this little gadget, which is a Bluetooth thing, and it takes the signal from the TV, puts it straight into the hearing aid, adjusts the hearing aid so that it accommodates the volume on the TV. So if, you, if any of you had aging parents, you would know that they sit there and watch TV, and they turn the TV up and everybody leaves the room because it's so loud, you can't stand it, okay? So then the person's sitting there all by themselves. So with this device, she could sit there, she could hear because it turned up the hearing aid, everybody else could hear the TV at the regular uh, level, and they would sit there and, you know, eat popcorn and watch TV, and everybody was happy. Simple little Bluetooth thing. Very expensive, but, um, but worth the money. Um, we got her a sensor for the bed because a big problem of aging people is that they fall. CD and, and colleagues are having a big, a, a national world conference, world congress on falls here in Malaysia in December. If you're interested in hearing more about technology, uh, we got her a, this bed sensor because we try. She would get out of bed at night to go to the bathroom and then she would fall. With the bed sensor. Um, the caregivers were alerted that she was moving, and they would run in, and we didn't prevent all the falls, but we prevented half the falls. And we tried, we had tried a light, we had tried a bell, we had tried all kinds of things. Finally, the sensor uh, worked. Um, she had a walker, and we did not have a high-tech fancy walker. In fact, the technology that people in the United States use on their walkers is that on each of the little legs, they put a tennis ball. So you take a tennis ball and cut it in half and that allows you to roll. My mother wasn't strong enough to control a, a walker on wheels, so the tennis ball accomplished the smoothness, but without the potential runaway uh, of, a, uh, of an electronic walker. Okay, uh, and then after three years of effort, we got her into a health system with a doctor that had connected all of her different doctors records. So the internist, the cardiologist, the audiologist, the ENT doctor, they all were on the same medical record system and they could all see what her blood pressure was two weeks ago when she went in to see some other doctor or report what they did so we have a comprehensive picture of her care. That was really hard to do. It took three years. We never got it fully implemented. Um, but that's the kind of thing you all can do now as opposed to try to do after the fact. Okay. So it would have been very uh, very helpful had we been able to accomplish it uh, even earlier. So those are all the technologies we used at the individual level uh, for my mother. There are a bunch of technologies we did not use. Okay. Um, I love these big fancy bathtubs. You guys seem to use a lot of showers. Um, we use a lot of bathtubs and most people, older people fall getting over the bathtub. So the first thing they give up when they get a little frail and older and lose some of their mobility, they stop taking baths. And then they smell, and then they get UTIs, and it's, you think I'm kidding, it's not. My mother smelled terrible. I had to move in with her and, and get her to take a bath because 
she just said, well, I can't do it, so I don't. Like, okay, that's not really good. Okay, and she didn't wash her hair, it was awful. So anyway, um, I could never get the bathtub, which is great, but my sister wouldn't allow the bathtub to be put in the home. So technology is wonderful, but people have to agree to it. Same thing with the fancy toilet. Okay. Asian toilets, the holes in the ground that, that are prevalent throughout Asia, those are really dangerous for old people. Okay. In Bhutan, where I was for three and a half months, their biggest source of injuries in the hospital was older people trying to use the Asian toilets and slipping and falling in the hospital in the toilet. So, you know, you can, you can avoid that. These Japanese toilets are great because the lid raises, the lid closes, there's a lot of water cleaning going on, people don't get UTIs and end up in a hospital with a urinary tract infection, uh, and the water doesn't go all over the floor. Okay. So, you know, if we'd been able to get her uh, this, we would have saved several trips to the emergency rooms with UTIs. Okay. Um, we didn't use a bed light because we had all the caregivers and the bed light just didn't work. The bed sensor was better. Okay. Um, this is um, a life call button. These are throughout the United States. You, anybody can, can buy them and it's a service for $20 a month or you know, 80 renas a month or something. And if uh, particularly older people who live alone, if they fall, they can push the button. The button goes to a national call center and it's in Boston for at least one of the companies. Within two minutes, they will call 911, our emergency response service, and they will call the neighbor or whoever the person put on their list of you know, emergency contact. So within two minutes, no matter where you are in the nation, if you have one of these and you press the button, they will get you help. Okay. Really valuable for pe older people who live alone or alone for part of the day. And that's a national high-tech thing, but it's been around, we've had that for 30 years or more, national companies offering that. Um, we did not use the robots, so Japan has a lot of robots, both for healthcare and just to keep people company. We had so many people coming and going in that house that we did not need a robot. It would have been a lot easier to deal with a robot than some of the caregivers and family members. Okay. So I wish we'd had a robot. Okay. So these are just examples of technology we didn't use. Um, the one thing that we, I wish we had had, these are, if you know Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, if you know that story, Dorothy's red shoes, they were magic. My mother uh, had really deformed feet. There was no technology that we could get that would fix her feet. And she was stubborn and she would not wear shoes and we could get, not get shoes that would fit. Um, so, so she just said, we live in California, it varies on the rain, so I'm just gonna go barefoot. Who needs shoes? So for the last five years of her life, um, she went without shoes. So technology is wonderful. You can do lots of good things with technology. Uh, you can't fix all problems. And you have to start with the people. So, you know, the family members, the caregivers, and that educating the caregivers about what technology there is and how to use it uh, is a really good place to start. So anyway, so those are just uh, some examples of some of the things that can be done on an individual level. So. All right, I think it's four o'clock. Tea is waiting. So uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for inviting me to come and talk.